you know, as a novelist, you're always interested in um, something that, that feels new, that feels it adds to the kind of arsenal of the fiction. Of fiction. And um, I always feel, I, I sort of feel that there's something about, um, we've seen the footnote quite extensively used in recent years in novels. And the reason they're effective is because the footnote, the existence of the footnote, um, you know, immediately introduces a problem for the reader. A happy problem if it's done properly. An unhappy problem if it's done badly. Um, the happy problem is that um, you do have to decide what are you going to read. Are you going to read the main body of the text or the footnote? And that refers essentially to the sort of difficulty of um, of, of, bound, of making of drawing a boundary around any kind of text or any kind of story, and it draws attention to the you know all sorts of things, the artificiality of the story, the arbitrariness of, of storyline A as opposed to storyline B, and um, and I suppose it sort of feels accurate to have a bunch of, of simultaneous um, things being said about a certain subject. And the footnote also, I suppose, refers to the idea of, or, you know, authenticity, authenticating the, what's being, as in an academic footnote, sourcing the, uh, the content, etc. Um, but I hadn't seen any parentheses. And I, I just want, and I felt that in this book, which is so concerned with the difficulty of sustaining any kind of assertion about anything, the difficulty of, of, that the rational mind has in arriving at productive conclusions about how to live. I mean, it's, we have this, the, uh, we have this equipment of reason and we have knowledge, modern knowledge, and, we have a, and with the internet we have unlimited data about the world, and yet it's still extremely difficult to live. Um, the, that, the progress that we have, um, that we've made in all sorts of realms, technological in particular, is apparently not matched by um, other kinds of progress. So that in this instance, for example, this guy breaks up with his girlfriend and, um, you know, he sort of says, he goes online. What should I do? He goes online. He wants to find out what to do about this problem of having broken up with his girlfriend. And she talks about humiliation. She feels a lot of humiliation. So he feels that he, in order to understand her, that he can go on, he should be able to go online at this point, Google humiliation, and, and find a community of people who know about humiliation and are able to share their knowledge of humiliation and how it works and what to do about it. And apparently not. There's just crazy people out there. <laughs> and uh, particularly the people who are interested in humiliation. So it dawns on him that you can't that the age of reason and that the enlightenment and the existence of philosophy and, the and all the rest of it hasn't actually helped us very much, or it helped us a little bit, but not that much, with the essential darkness uh, in which a human life must be lived. And, um, and so the parentheses for me represent, first of all, they sort of, they look, I like that, they sort of look fun and look interesting, and they're kind of, they're logical if you see what's being written about. And the second thing is that they sort of, I suppose, signal um, they signal at this problem I've been talking about, at the problem of, of the, the statement that doesn't have parentheses, a statement that is unqualified, a statement that is a, purports to be a very simple description of the world, as if that were such a straightforward thing. And so, they, it's, so it's undermines, it's simultaneously, of course the point of the parentheses, according to this guy, essentially is to be more specific and more detailed about everything. But in fact, he ends up under, often end up undermining um, you know, uh, the basic clarity of what he's trying to accomplish and getting lost in these forests of brackets.